Dave, I'd like you to comment on a, a quote from Beyond Sovereignty from the top of page 11 from um, the chapter, The Global Imperative to Begin to Exist. It says, I accept salvation as to create Christ. Now for the first time in history, the ego hears as such the godly imperative of God. Create Christ's salvation. In the hearing of this word, the ego is stripped of the essence of self-consciousness. In acting on this imperative, the ego is for the first time pure other consciousness. The thinking thing is the absolute actuality of the other for the first time. I'm very interested in this line about uh, the imperative of creating Christ's salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, what I notice is the context, uh, beginning at the bottom of page 10, um, I lead into this with uh, reference to Walt Whitman, followed by a reference to Jonathan Edwards. Um, I think we all know who Walt Whitman is, right? Although nowadays it's hard to know whether we all do or not. Uh, great, maybe some people might say the greatest American poet of the 19th century, and uh, Jonathan Edwards, a Puritan theologian and philosopher, um, and a philosopher in the context where he had a, in the, in the context of his day, a genuine scientific interest in, in, uh, in the development of science as it stood. Um, so Whitman's, uh, I referenced Whitman at the bottom of page 10. What now actually occurs is not Walt Whitman's radical deduction of American consciousness. I mean, this is my characterization of his thought. Um, uh, but I think the quotation from Whitman, I think there's a footnote there, that uh, it's Whitman saying, I accept time uh, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, so I say what now actually occurs is not Walt Whitman's radical deduction of American consciousness, I accept time absolutely, the incarnation in the form of the always now of the novus ordo seclorum, uh, the secular effectiveness. All right, let me pause there. So the Novus Ordo Seclorum, as you know, is on, your, on the, seal of the Great Seal of the United States. It's the uh, Latin motto, the new order, literally, of the ages. Uh, but in Latin, it could easily and can legitimately be translated as the New World Order, ironically, right? Mm -hmm. So the New World Order was not invented by uh, uh, George H.W. Bush, uh, but he was drawing on, whether consciously or not, uh, something foundational to the American experiment, as it were, right? Okay. Um, so we have, and there you have a kind of um, secular or secular leaning um, derivative, right, of um, Paul's new creation. Right? And I'm saying, I'm saying that the in the thinking now occurring, it's crystal clear. Uh, that the incarnation affects over time, as you would expect it to do in a temporal world, uh, affects over time a transformation of the world. Right? Uh, this would be a particular um, echo of that general notion that comes into Western civilization in and through uh, Christianity. Uh, so the new world order, uh, or the new order of ages, and then the particular reference to um, uh, uh, to Whitman, uh, Whitman's statement, I accept time absolutely, um, is, well, or, so I'll go ahead to Edwards because I, I, I can make the same point about both of them, I think. Um, so I say that statement in Whitman, I accept time absolutely, is the secular effectiveness of Jonathan Edwards' thought to wit, I worship the apparent Christ. So, Christ, so Edwards is speaking in his uh, persona as a, as a believer, as a, a Puritan divine, uh, and he accepts uh, the, uh, I worship the apparent Christ. This gets a little complicated because the Americans have to have it said on their behalf is that they complicate the story I've been telling you all along. <laughs> What can I do? <laughs> so, but to try and simplify it a little bit, uh, 
if it's true in Hegel, which it is, right, that the, the other's uh, being is, to put it mildly, precarious, that it's there only to be consumed mm -hmm. and to be shown to be in and of itself a nothingness driving toward its own nothingness. Uh, uh, in other words, if the, uh, if the existence of the other, the finite, over against the infinite, the absolute self-knower, is uh, a merely ideal limitation upon it, that it, in and through which it comes to realize its own absoluteness in the full cycle of the dialectic, infinitely repeated. In American thought, things change. They change significantly. To go back to the language that we were emphasizing, or I was emphasizing when we started this conversation, I would say they don't change essentially. And to put it concretely in terms of the previous uh, things we've been saying, it doesn't change essentially in American thought because the self doesn't disappear, as it were. Uh, it's still there. However, there is a real change over against European modernity. Uh, and, the, uh, and we have, whether everybody knows it or not, we have our distinctively American uh, philosophical tradition known as pragmatism, the uh, father or founder of which would be C.S. Peirce, um, beginning in the middle of the 19th century, and he lived into uh, the early 20th, died in 1914. And um, pragmatism has a lot of interesting and a lot of things to say different from the absolutism of Hegel. Uh, Peirce was totally familiar with both Hegel and Kant, and unlike them, totally familiar, well, I say totally, widely and deeply familiar with the uh, medieval tradition, which in the European notion of modernity was completely uh, discounted, right? In other words, the world really begins with modernity in Europe, and uh, if there's anything good, it, it didn't happen in the Middle Ages, uh, so it's, it's kind of erased. For example, when you read Hegel's three-volume, not that he had no room, right? Three-volume history of philosophy, you'll find that Thomas Aquinas is given one page, literally one page, okay? So that's just a very concrete existential example of what I'm talking about. Not so in America, right? So we had a distance, both geographical and psychological and epistemological and uh, ontological, on Europe. And the distance consists in terms of lots of ways of formulating it. But in this context, it consists in a couple of things. Uh, one, and most noticeably, on the question of self. In American pragmatic understanding, the relationship between the self and the other, if I can boil it all down to that um, dichotomy or dualism, uh, is an irreducible tension or an irreducible relationship. In other words, there's no reduction of the other in American thought and in American pragmatism as the index of American, of deep American consciousness. Uh, there's no reduction of the other to merely being, as it is in Hegel and in Europe and generally, a function of the self. Okay? So it has a, a being, of, it has some kind of being of its own mm -hmm. in American pragmatism that's explicitly and emphatically denied uh, by Hegel, and of which Hegel denies that it has any notion itself. Uh, that is, the finite has no notion of its own being. It has really a notion of its own nothingness. Um, and by the way, you see this reflected up until uh, the current stage of our politics in the notion of uh, give and take, uh, compromise, uh, we can't have it all, and so forth, right? So the polarization that we're experiencing at this point in history, whether or not it's unprecedented, I'm not entirely sure, but um, nevertheless is, is um, not characteristically an American, uh, peculiarly American enterprise. In fact, it's a kind of what the Greeks would call a stasis. It's a revolutionary moment politically in which stasis in, the, in this context would have suggested and did to Aristotle a complete standoff, right? So, and the standoff is the pref prelude historically now to civil war. Whether we're at that point or not is another question, but I'm just making the analogy 
that that's not characteristic characteristic of the deepest uh, American consciousness, which is to acknowledge uh, an irreducible relationship, and therefore, if you put it in political sociological terms, a kind of working out of the difference between the self and the other, mm -hmm. and not simply in principle a reduction of the self to uh, of the other to a function of the self. All right. Um, so that's one way of understanding it. And the reason I, I found myself saying, here's another insight. I love talking to people because I have these thoughts I've never had before. So uh, I just had another uh, brainstorm. It's a quick lightning. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I said that the uh, other in American consciousness doesn't you know, retain some being of its own, it has a, alongside of the self, that's what I'm saying. So they kind of share a kind of being. Well, that notion of a shared being is more deeply rooted in Peirce's notion that there's no such thing as, I want to say, absolute nothing. Now, he wasn't the first to think that, but he makes that a principle of his thought. So is there a kind of nothingness in Peirce? Because we see it's there either in postmodernity, it gets out of the, it gets out of the modern, the, the classical modern bag. Right? It's, 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 it's no longer nothing outside of absolute self-enclosed consciousness. It's now nothing permeating uh, what is now a, a leaky bucket. Okay? That's post-modernity. Uh, but in American thought, we're not directly subject to that. I mean, we have our reflections of it. But uh, we're not directly subject to it because already, in principle, uh, Peirce makes the point that when it comes to being and non-being, or nothing, existence and nothing, they're not simply diametrical op opposites or incompatible notions as they would appear to be on the surface, right? That's why the out, nothing is outside of what is, everything that is in, in, in Hegel, because there's no room for it inside, right, as it were. If it gets inside, there's something really wrong, right? Okay. Um, the boat is sinking. Is, would be the metaphor. Right? Uh, but in Peirce, this is taken care of up front. Being and existence, or being and nothing in Peirce, merge. Right? So they're never simply polar opposites. They merge, and they not only merge, but they merge insensibly. So they merge in such a way that we don't necessarily detect it as it were on the surface of things, but it's there ontologically, foundationally, this merging. Well, if you think of merging, blending, right, uh, fondue, right, uh, if you think of that, you think of a kind of indistinctness, but not a total indistinctness, right? It's a merging, but there's a kind of vagueness. And so vagueness comes to the fore in pragmatism, in purse as vagueness, in uh, William James, who is a kind of intellectual heir and successor in the pragmatic uh, line of thought to Peirce, uh, in William James it comes in, in James's notion that there's a fringe around everything. There's no, despite the fact that thinking now occurring speaks of an absolute edge, existence is absolute edge everywhere and always for the first time. Yeah. In James, existence or any entity has a fringe around it. There's no absolute edge for sure, right? Um, or uh, as he says, and I think I quote him, uh, or I quote him, whether he says it or not, I shouldn't do that. Uh, he says, in effect, if not literally, um, the definite is known indefinitely, and the indefinite is definitely known. It's that kind. Of, so he inherits that kind of merging idea of uh, definiteness and indefiniteness, being and non-being, et cetera, from, from, uh, from person. He puts his own spin on it. Okay. Corollary of that in terms of the relationship between the mind and reality. Right? So if, the, if in Europe the mind is the mind of an absolute self-knower, then reality has to be some sort of otherness. And in order for it to be a function of the absolute dialectic of the absolute self Noah, as function of that, it has no truth of its own. It only has a truth or being insofar as it has that function ideally. Whereas, if the self and the other 
as it were, coexist in American pragmatism, then the corollary of that, if I put it in terms of mind and reality, is that there's no, there's no subsumption, there's no complete exhaustion of the real in the form of mind, analogous to Hegel. On the other hand, there's no polarity. So the mind is always in touch with the real in American pragmatism, but it is, as it were, infinitesimally close to the real. Right? It's, it's never finally and simply in touch with the real, but it's not disconnected from it. So there's a kind of infinite clarification of the real in the mind. If I transpose this cosmologically and historically, what that means in American thought is that there is a kind of infinite tendency. I don't want to say progression, that's a little too strong, because the progress is overall what it allows for what you might call backsliding or dead ends, right? Not altogether unlike the Darwinian uh, notion of evolution, which allows for dead ends. Uh, I don't know whether it allows offhand, I just don't know, uh, for backsliding, but it certainly allows for dead ends, okay? Um, so you have an, a, and, and Peirce was a kind of evolutionist. He was an evolutionist. He wasn't necessarily a Darwinian evolutionist. There are various kinds of evolution, despite uh, the one we've zeroed in on in, the, in our contemporary world. So uh, cosmologically and historically, that continuity between the real and the mind, as imperfect as it may be, has an overall tendency in which the mind approaches an ideal final state in which through the agreement of the in community of intelligent beings, the real will be known. Now I say it approaches that state, it never arrives. It never, looking back, so to speak, to a real from which the mind is in the, uh, the, in the, mind of, uh, in the process of qualifying, you could imagine in the future a fully clarified real, which at that point would be all there was, there was a real. It would be a function of the agreement of the community of intelligent beings, which in purse is much wider, uh, much more imaginative. You might say critically fanciful that it would be in the uh, relatively sober European model. Mm. I think he was influenced by the medieval thinkers who were not so straight-laced. Uh, so we can imagine communities of intelligent beings. I don't think Peirce would ever say angels, but they're the, they would be the American equivalent of angels. Mm. Uh, in other words, you don't have to be a human being to be an intelligent being. So we don't have any kind of, we don't have our contemporary materialistic reductionism. Right. It's, it's not there in pragmatism. Um, Okay. Uh, so when I, oh, okay, and therefore, to go back to Whitman, mm -hmm. when Whitman says, as the American poet of his day, uh, I accept time, what is it? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he accepts time absolutely in the sense that we're also beyond already in pragmatism. We're altogether beyond it in the thinking now occurring but we are also significantly beyond the dichotomy of eternity and time, right? So, speaking of evolution, Peirce has the temerity to say when he poses to himself a hypothetical question, do you believe in the platonic ideas, which are eternal, changeless, we discussed. Peirce says, well, yeah, yeah but as long as we understand that they change. <laughs> <laughs> so Peirce has no problem having having blurred in a mm -hmm. constructive way being and non-being into a kind of middle ground, a vague merging. He doesn't have any problem with change, eternal change, uh, change or the eternal forms of some other changing. And as Paul, uh, Whitman's emphasis uh, uh, brings to the fore, the real emphasis there is that the, whatever the eternal verities or whatever the ideas are that we would might start off assuming to be um, uh, unchanging, since they're not assumed to be unchanging, then we assume that they're going to evolve and grow and develop over time, and that some ideas are going to be good ideas, 
and they'll survive, right? By the, it's a kind of a version. I don't want to overdo it. Some, the survival of the fittest ideas. Something like that. I don't think he ever uses that term. Uh, and bad ideas will just cease. They won't be in the big roundup uh, in the universal communal consensus about what the real is. Right? Now notice there is a trace there, an important trace of, of European consciousness, because the community is going to decide. The guys who are the more particular, and is more particularized, right? Uh, they're going to, those intelligent beings are going to agree on what, what is real, right? So that consensus is on the side of what otherwise would be a pure self-consciousness in Europe, right? But it's, but it's that trace of that. Um, but what I was starting to say was that the ideas develop and change, and the form of the change and development of the ideas is temporal, right? So in other words, there's a long run, temporal long run, in which this final consensus concerning the real will ideally, but never actually, exist, because the approach to it will uh, break down into infinitesimal approximations of it, you follow? Mm -hmm. So there's a still a kind of important idealism, but now the ideal of Hegel has become an ideal. So we have the ideal of an absolute, in effect, I'm not saying in effect, maybe not literally in person, we, uh, we have the ideal of an absolute uh, knowledge, an absolute knower, but we never actually arrive at it, but we approximate it more closely in each time. But since time is, so in other words, if I take the image of the uh, Hegelian absolute self-enclosed mind, which is an eternal actuality, it's as if you were to take that, that sphere and soak it in temporality, mm -hmm. right? So in other words, temporality enters into what otherwise would be the eternal actuality of both Hegel and analogously, not literally, of Hegel and Plato. I mean, of Aristotle and Plato, right? So now we have a temporalization of what otherwise would be the unchanging um, eternal ideas of the tradition. And uh, so when Whitman says, I accept time, absolutely, uh, I think that's the background in which we can, uh, not, that he was, not that he was doing purse, because actually he couldn't have been doing purse historically, but they're in the, sp they're in the same stream of consciousness, yeah. if I can use a phrase from uh, James, uh, in which Whitman would be, right? So Whitman's idea is uh, of the divine mind, again, pre-pragmatic, but consonant with pragmatism, is a great crescive self. It's a self that's going beyond itself, uh, as it were, perpetually, right? So you have this kind of reflection. Um, okay. All right. Having said that, uh, the, um, I follow it up closely with Jonathan Edwards' uh, analogous statement, uh, as I read it, uh, to wit, I worship the apparent Christ. So apparent there uh, refers to the fact that if you got into Jonathan Edwards' uh, theology or philosophy, um, what he speaks of, uh, the phrase which I captures the essence of Jonathan Edwards, which is reflected subliminally in this particular quotation, is that I accept the apparent Christ reflects his metaphysical understanding that God has the greatest share of the universe. So in other words, God is subject to the kind of categories that are apply to the world of appearance. In a certain way, in Edwards, God is appearing in and as the appearances, the apparent, the apparent universe, what I'm saying, right? Uh, and he's sharing that uh, with others, uh, other uh, uh, inhabitants of that universe. What distinguishes him is that he has the greatest share, right? So already we have a kind of, I don't want to call it a simple materialization, but we have a well, we have another example in its own very specific way of a, of a resonance, of, a, of an effect in thought, in a very specific way, of the incarnation. If the word becomes flesh, 
uh, then, right? And then especially the God of Jonathan Edwards. And I think the God, um, well, I won't say that. Uh, the God of Jonathan Edwards, as this quotation makes clear, is very much, very much the God incarnate, right? Very much the Christ, right? Which is the word incarnate. So he worships the apparent Christ. He worships Christ incarnate, you might understand. But I think the implication is not altogether foreign to the thinking now occurring, what I was talking about earlier, uh, that, it, that God is somehow or other has involved himself part and parcel, not, ex not altogether, but as, as having the greatest share in the world of appearance, in the, in the, in the world of, of what Kant would understand immediately as the world of scientific uh, objects and the world of, uh, of uh, uh, scientific human cognition, right? That's where Jen Edwards is at. Now, what you notice in the two quotations, and I assume I'm not misquoting them because it's, I haven't looked at this since you brought it to my attention uh, previously. I mean, I haven't looked at it again. So I accept that I'm doing a good, rigorous job of quotation. What, what note, I accept that because I accept that they both say accept. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, th and they leave it at that, all right? In other words, so what I'm calling attention to by that background introduction to the phrase that catches your mm -hmm. interest where I say, on behalf of the thinking now occurring, I perceive, uh, I accept to create time absolutely, mm -hmm. is, is, that's precisely the, the key word there, is to create. And the create, I don't simply accept the creation as a given, uh, or in Jonathan Edwards' case, nor do I simply accept it as irreducibly temporalized, as uh, Whitman is saying, in effect, right? Uh, what is accepted or received, and this goes back to something we were saying a little while back, is one accepts the gift, qua gift, one accepts the, I want to say, I, I don't want to overstress this word, but I, one accepts the, the imperative, which is a word I use especially in the, uh, in Beyond Sovereignty, because of the, uh, it begins in the ethics, but then it winds up in the morality table in section three, uh, the list of the nine moral and uh, nine imperatives of what I call the new morality or the new normalcy, uh, all of which are imperatives in one form or another to love, uh, but also one of them is to be engaged uh, with the world, right? I don't mean to be a more concrete expression of what that love means. So, so um, it's the, not simply the accepting of the creation, not simply accepting of the temporalization, not simply of, the, uh, of one form, at least, of the incarnational implications of the creation at this point in history, that is post-incarnation, uh, but the acceptance of the, of the giftedness and the, of the imperative, which is minimally implicit in, in in existence as gift. The gratitude, the form of that gratitude is not a matter of just feeling grateful, right? I mean, I think there are a lot of people who can feel grateful that they exist. I think there are such people. Uh, but the form of the, what, what's required, the true form of gratitude is for the created omnipotence, which has received existence as such independently and f in a complete freedom. The, the the form of that gratitude is to respond by, to respond to the implicit imperative of the gift, and that is to, I, I, don't, I don't mean this literally, but as it were, to give back. Mm -hmm. That is to, uh, to create the world, right? To, uh, again, speaking a little crudely, to take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, but the, res but the key idea here, and again, a word I'm not particularly fond of, the responsibility, the imperative I like better, mm -hmm. to take responsibility for the, the world. And that, if the world is always and everywhere existing for the first time, then it's to take responsibility for the, in effect, for the creation uh, of, of, the, uh, of the world, or more particularly of the new world. And in this context, there's the interesting statement of creating Christ's salvation. Mm 
Right, because okay, so it's it's again it's implicit. I don't I don't think I I don't think I magnify that. Uh, well, I, I accept salvation as to create Christ. Right? Is that you say what now actually occurs is I accept to create time absolutely. I worship the apparent creation of Christ. I perceive God as the absolute appearance of God for the first time. I accept salvation as to create Christ. Right. So if, we, if, we, if I put it in a theological register, Christ comes and he redeems mankind in and through the crucifixion and resurrection. He brings salvation. And if one has to work out, as I think it's Paul who says, one salvation, echoed loudly by um, Kierkegaard, uh, one has to work out one's salvation in fear and trembling, right? Then, and I don't want to get back into the old uh, Reformation arguments, but whatever the distinction is between justification and, and salvation, right. uh, you could say that in some sense justification is a, is a one is a one offer, but salvation, the working out of one's salvation, is something that takes time, and, mm. and right? Okay, mm -hmm. so it's that kind of thing. But in this case, in the context of the thinking now occurring, that salvation, of course, remains Christ's salvation, right? And the salvation is Christ's doing uh, on behalf of, but not just on behalf of, in and through mm -hmm. uh, uh, those who are incorporated in him as members of his body, right? So they're working out their, their salvation and the salvation of the world are not really, in the thinking now occurring, clearly not distinguishable things. I'm not sure they are in the best theology either, but here, the whole point here is that this is now intelligible as part and parcel of the very form of thinking of our being in relation to the world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. As uh, we are the qua-created omnipotence, we are qua-embodied in Christ, we are the saviors, as it were, as it were, by delegation, right, uh, of the world. Mm. Yeah. And the saving of the world and the creating of the world are hardly able to be distinguished at this point. Mm. Right? Interesting. Right. The saving and the creation are, are hardly distinguishable. Well, yeah, or to put it in Pauline language, the saving of the world and the new creation are identical. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the quote again for a moment. Okay. Well, that, that explains the, the, the second part of the quotation here. Uh, in, the, in the hearing of this word, the ego is stripped of the essence of self-consciousness. Yeah, in this is not my world. Yeah. Right? So even, it sounds very um, dangerous. A good friend of mine said to me the other day on the phone, uh, Borders on heresy, right? Created omnipotence, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in a self-conscious framework, it could be heard that way, mm -hmm. right? But it, it couldn't be not carefully heard that way because you would have to drop the word created in order yeah. to, to hear that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but created omnipotence uh, says what? That it, uh, I'm creating the world in the identical way, as it were, that God created the world in the first place. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm responding to the imperative to create, to newly create the new creation, to newly create, in that sense, to save the world. Mm -hmm. I am, the, as it were, in traditional terms, I'm like, as it were, the instrument. Although I think it's much stronger than that, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and what would you use if it was stronger than that in terms of the wording of it? The thing that comes to my mind, which is not going to satisfy, is person. I'm the person to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But that's very concrete and existential, and I like it. It's even more immediate. Though. It's more. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Now. Yeah, yeah. We mm -hmm. are, the, but it's not just this eye, because <laughs> this eye doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? Right. No, right. So it's it's we. We are right. um, the ones who are right. responding to the imperative to create the, and save the world. And that's it's interesting because uh, it's not that the it's not that my existence or your existence is dependent upon each other's existence. I mean, you've already right. explained that there is this this discontinuity in some way. But, we, but there, you could say that we are creating each, or ca can you say that we're, we're creating each other? Creating as... Yeah, as I think we've kind of covered that, but I mean, yeah, yeah everything depends on the context. Yes, yeah. 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 Uh, 
Yeah, I found myself pondering that more. I think that's why it, right. it, it uh, came up again. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're creating the other precisely not in the way that's an alternative to the, what we were talking about a long time ago, the uh, absolute uniqueness and singularity and particularity of, the, of, of, the, of each other, right? So in other words, it's again that um, identity and difference uh, with no additional uh, back, backtracking to a, to a second level of difference. Right. right. So you have to be, you, as it were, you have to be content with the immediacy of the of the of the reality. Mm. Right. 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 Which, for some reason, reminds me of a question about the nothing that I didn't ask, <laughs> uh, because I mean it begs the question: the the, the ex nihilo in the you know in the, uh, the the Latin version of creation, right? Right. right. And it's obviously not. Um, it's obviously distinguishable from this nothing that we understand to be in, in Hegel's thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and the world isn't uh, essentially made out of this nothing. It's, no. it's what's the understanding of the ex nihilo in the, in the thinking now? Uh, well, okay. it's, I think as far as it goes, it's not, uh, I mean, it may go further, but as far as it goes, it's, as far as Thomas goes, I think it's uh, perfectly consistent. Uh, <clears throat> but, but you use the, I forget how made out of, you said. And that's important. Uh, because uh, when Thomas raises the issue, and I, uh, I quote him on this topic again in uh, Novi Test Mundi in the, in the appropriate place, um, in Latin, the phrase ex nihilo, um, it's the ex and exit, it goes out, mm -hmm. right? So, or from, it can mean from, and, but it's ambiguous, even in Latin. I mean, it could be, right? Um, and in Latin, the two major uh, possible ways of reading it that he deals with are what you would call a material relationship and, and a temporal relationship. Even temporal is wrong. <laughs> uh, more like an ontological relationship. Mm -hmm. That is to say, he rules out, he explicitly rules out that the correct understanding of ex nihilo is that the world is made out of mm -hmm. matter. Or, or out of nothing. Out of nothing. As if as if nothing was, was a matter, right. right? And there are analogies, by the way, in the tradition between the notion of nothing or nothingness and uh, matter, because prime matter in Aristotle, pure matter, we never experience it, but it exists as a concept in Aristotle. Prime matter is precisely by definition without any form. So if we were confronted, which we never are with prime matter, then uh, we wouldn't. It would have. We wouldn't be able to distinguish it uh, within itself or from anything else, for that matter. Right? It would have no distinctness at all. That's what would make it pure, pure potentiality, no actuality whatsoever. Um, um, again, so, give me uh, the, the question again, one more time. The, well, the question was about yeah. the meaning of ex nihilo. Okay. So, so Thomas rules out that. Nothing is related to the uh, to the world that's created, as as that out of which it is made. It's not a material relationship. It's not like marble is out of which I made the statue. Mm -hmm. And he says it has the has a temporal connotation. Again, this this breaks down, but uh, I mean it breaks down. It's it's a problem logically, but this is what he's saying, is that the world is created after nothing. So in other words, there's nothing before the world is created, right? Um, well, it's as simple as that, right? So it's a, it's a, as it were, a kind of ontologically chronological relationship. Right. It's, a, it's before and after. Before the world, there was nothing other than God, you might say. Yeah. Although I don't think he says that at that point. Um, but there was no world, period. And the, ah, the key point. Mm -hmm. uh, let's concretize it. It's too abstract at this point. The key, the key implication of this quibble about the X is, has to do precisely with omnipotence. Hmm. Because what nothing, I've just, uh, I've effectively made the connection. If nothing were the matter out of which 
the world was made, right, the stuff out of which the world was made, then that would be the equivalent qua matter as the potentiality for the world existing before the world. Right? Mm -hmm. But if there was a potentiality for the world to exist before it was actually brought into existence by the creator, then the creator would not be omnipotent. Mm -hmm. Omnipotence is precisely bringing into existence that for which there is no potentiality whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Right, that, so that's the ultimate importance, metaphysically, of that, uh, of that little distinction. But it's an important distinction. By the way, since we're on the nothing yeah. again from another angle, it's, it was very interesting to me many years ago when I was reading, assiduously reading the uh, Institutes of Calvin and other stuff that Calvin put out, that Calvin uh, has no qualms about identifying nature, uh, the creation, as nihil, mm. straight out, unqualified, right? So the opposition between being and nothing, not surprisingly, given the development of modern European uh, thought up through and including Hegel, and then maybe the reappearance of the um, getting out of the bag of the, of the, of the modern nothing, right? the nothing is there in the natural world in, uh, in Calvin's uh, writing as, as a kind of a given. right? And in a certain sense, if you come at it uh, from, a, from the preceding medieval context, it's, it's somewhat shocking, actually, if you, if you pause, right, that, that, that nature in the world is, is nihil, nothing, right? Um, he must have been really upset about something. Huh? He must have been really upset well, about something. Well, I could something. have been it. I think it's a corollary of his other famous notion, which takes the uh, form of the um, doctrine of the double predestination right. uh, of the sovereignty of God. So he wants to exalt... I think, by the way, this is really the God. This is really the God that uh, Thomas Altizer has it in for, yeah. the transcendent deity, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, the absolute sovereignty of God, in the sense of which uh, uh, Calvin uh, intends it, um, the absolute yeah. plan too, right? Just to playing into that. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, sure. Double, double predestination yeah. is that. that not only. The yeah, there's thing. not. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, but, but the church never thought that Calvin was orthodox. So. <laughs> yes. So, uh, I think I have a couple other questions for you. All right. Uh, one about, You're indef uh, indefatigable. Yeah, well, you know, um, I wouldn't exactly say that, but, uh, this one comes from, uh, Beyond Sovereignty again, uh, page uh, 20 of the preface. Okay. And it's about the notion of of beneficence okay. that plays l large in uh, in this book. Um, you know, you call it a, a perfectly one-sided activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beneficence is always and everywhere the perfectly one-sided activity of persons attending to the appearance itself of existence now for the mm -hmm. first time. Mm -hmm. And then I think, I mean, I think you've effectively answered a lot of my question oh. this, but uh, about this, but uh, it was something that's uh, st uh, stuck out for me, and mm -hmm. and uh, particularly the word beneficence, and it being a one-sided activity. Yes, well, I think probably uh, what uh, I have in mind there is that it's done, a, benefic a beneficent act is done in the absence of any notion of self, um, for the other, you know, you might say absolutely for the good of the other. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think in that sense, it fulfills, um, I mean, it really even fulfills what Aristotle would understand, I don't know whether he would use the term, it fulfills Aristotle's definition of uh, what is effectively love, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, willing the good of the other, or Aristotle would, yeah, well, he would, but he would use the Greek idea of uh, 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 comes out in Philadelphia, right? The brotherly love, the love of the, the, the friendship, friendship, all right? So uh, if I have a friend, I have many different reasons why I might love my friend. Uh, the lowest of them being for Aristotle, the pleasure that I enjoy. We have a good time together. Uh, I might love my friend because he's very useful to me, right? 
Um, he knows a lot of stuff that I can take advantage of, or he has friends, or he has a network of uh, contacts and get me a job and so forth, and I'm very grateful mm -hmm. and I love him. But the proper reason to love him for Aristotle is for, for the sake of, his, of the goodness of the friend, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I've already uh, pointed out that there's a limit to, as it were, how much I can love the other. I can't love the other at my expense in Aristotle, right? My first regard is for myself. Assuming I can, assuming there's no incompatibility, I can, I can, I can love my friend uh, primarily for his for his own sake. We would say, right, for his own goodness. Um, so I think here in, in one sided, I'm uh, it, just as I'm ruling out in the thinking now occurring altogether the notion of self or self reference. Um, one sided is a, an emphatic way of bringing that to bear on the relationship um, to the other in an act of beneficence. In other words, it's a way of uh, saying, it's kind of shorthand for saying, this, my doing good for the other has no reference whatsoever to any notion of self, uh, and most especially not to any notion of myself or, my, or by, by inference by my self-interest. I do it because it's the right thing to do vis-a-vis -vis this person, uh, qua this absolutely particular person, and then of course you got surrounding that the absolutely particular circumstance or context in which we're, we're dealing with one another, right? Right, right. Uh, I think that's it. It goes back perhaps to uh, something very abstract, which we probably not going to cover and didn't cover, uh, in foundation when I get into the... Um, into the geometry that flows out of the logic, right. and I discover there what I called at the time the absolute dead center cube. Even though I draw the cube two-dimensionally in three dimensions, uh, I described it ontologically as absolutely one-sided. Right. So another thing which we haven't discussed explicitly, although it's I was going to say it's there in the background, but the whole point is that there's no background. Right. The, uh, in other words, the, the difference between the foreground and the background. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not an ultimate reality in the thinking now occurring. Um, uh, so in that sense, what we normally think that everything has two sides, uh, an absolutely one-sided uh, plane or an absolutely one-sided cube um, is just a kind of geometric uh, analog to uh, what might be applied here ethically. Um, but speaking of the geometric analog, there's an analog to that in our Mobius right. uh, uh, strip, where you twist the two ends of the, of the plane mm -hmm. uh, and uh, connect them together. And as you go around, you actually go from one, what had been one side to the other, mm -hmm. without crossing over from one side to another. Right. So I don't know, there's a, I never thought of it as a perfect analog, but it gives you a, a sense mm. that there's more to our um, understanding of, of space than might meet the eye, and and especially so if there is no space. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no space, and then how love functions in, in or. Sorry, let me just jump in. The mic fell down, so I'm not sure if it's not working. Thanks. Okay. I mean, it's it's interesting to um, contemplate the. I say function of love for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. but it's it it feels like the love in in, in some sense um, is living alive. It's not something like you said that can be appropriated in any particular relationship. It can't, right. you know, right. love can't be appropriated by itself. You can't have it and keep it for yourself and oh. gain more of it. It's something right. that uh, uh, unless you're willing to talk about self love, right? Um, yeah. No, I think that's right. And we have, uh, again, in terms of tradition, the influence of the implicit and never radically, I mean, one way of, under, I don't like the word radical, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. Essential is better. The essential criticism of the very notion of self-reference that is part and parcel of the thinking now occurring, you know, really hasn't occurred up until now. That's, you know, it's new. Okay. Uh, and since it hasn't occurred, we keep translating uh, the uh, second commandment as to love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. Right? But the Hebrew, and I'm no expert, but I've looked at this more than once, uh, the Hebrew says literally, 
uh, love your neighbor as you, hmm. right? In other words, there's no term uh, for self in there, just as there isn't, by the way, in the Latin and Greek languages. There's no noun substantive, right? No. right. Uh, um, so there's no necessity. To put it mildly, simply, there's, you can take that phrase, and there's no need to put self in there as a prefix or suffix or any form of the self is not necessary. Love the other as, as you, as, as another. You might, you might add, if you want to add anything, which I'm not recommending, as another you. As another you, right. <laughs> I wonder where that came in. I mean, that must have been. Well, I think it came in pretty early, but I'm not yeah. an expert. Yeah. I mean, it's there in the New Testament, because the New Testament employs the reflexive forms of. Oh, I see. Uh, so. I'm not saying there's no justification for it in the Old Testament. I, now I was looking up the Hebrew recently, so I haven't, I didn't, at the time, I didn't look up the Septuagint translation. It would be interesting. It may, it may be there in the Septuagint, hmm. in the Greek, which would not be totally surprising. Hmm. But all I'm saying is that it's an overdetermination of the text. quote that I think got pushed to the back somehow. Um, well, I know there's a lot that we could talk about that we mm -hmm. haven't talked about. Right. But I think one more, um, and I don't think I necessarily need or want you to explain how what the trinary logic is, but I know that that really is a very important foundational part of the thinking now occurring. It occurs in foundation and I know you've gone at lengths to describe the trinary logic in relation to uh, forms of binary logic, mm -hmm. Boolean logic, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know I guess that's the main binary logic that, that we know in our world and computers are, are based on. And Practically digits. speaking, yeah. And I wonder, you know, as you, I mean, we could probably sit here and speak about trinary logic for for eight hours, I would imagine. But do you see, like in um, the way in which Boolean logic has impacted our society with uh, the usage of computers, the development of computer languages and so forth. I mean, Boolean logic was essential to that development. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything that trinary logic might start to affect in our society, uh, like or analogously to Boolean logic? All right. Well, to try and give some substance to my answer, let me, I have to say a little bit about sure. the real trinary logic. <clears throat> it started when, um, it was a period of time when I was, uh, my main focus was Peirce. And, uh, and of course, Peirce is a logician, if he's nothing else. He's also a mathematician, but he's a logician primarily in his own mind. Um, his father was a, an important mathematician, so it was in his blood. Um, and Peirce, as a logician, is uh, familiar, among other, of many other things, with uh, Boole's logic. And he has a criticism of it. And it n not unrelated to um, what we were talking about on an ontological level earlier. Uh, Boole has these two logical symbols, a zero and a one. And the whole point of that is to um, create a logical calculus um, that will function algebraically. Right? In other words, x squared equals x when x equals 0, 0, 0 equals 0, and x squared equals x when x equals 1, 1 times 1 is 1. Okay. And it, it was to have a logical calculus that satisfied fundamental operations of algebra. Bull considers in his uh, magnum opus um, the question of whether or not you can add 1 and 0. Um, and the whole point of uh, his answer is that there's no answer to that. That is to say, 
That is to say, it doesn't compute, we would say. Well, he might have said that too, but he didn't have the same background for saying he doesn't compute. It doesn't compute because he has the notion that zero stands for nothing, logically, and one, in Bull's language, stands for the universe. It's a, it's a logical analog to the everything outside of which is nothing in, in, uh, in Hegel, right? And uh, so when I say he says it doesn't compute, what he says is you can't, you can't add zero to one. Hmm. So Peirce was more pragmatic in every, every sense of the word. And I figured, oh, wait a minute. Uh, when I go to, I, I, he doesn't say this literally, but I, uh, you know, you go to kindergarten or first grade, I, I know if I add one and zero, I get one. <laughs> So you can't tell me it doesn't, you can't, it doesn't compute. <laughs> so Bull's solu uh, uh, Peirce's solution to that uh, impasse in Boolean logic is um, the notion that why, the only reason that Bull can't add one and zero logically is that he doesn't have a logical oper addition operator. So it's a very, Right. So all I have to do is have a logic in which I could add these two, and I could add them. <laughs> so what he's saying is he doesn't have an operator to, to bring them together. So, he, so in, in Peirce, he adds them together. So 1 and 0, not surprisingly, equal 1, right? as they would in any event. Um, so when I was uh, reviewing all of this, uh, um, I was noting the difference, right? So, there's, so there is a relationship then, right? It's one of addition. It doesn't seem to change much on the surface, but it's not altogether unrelated to the notion that being and nothing merge, right? So the merging and the adding of the one to the other, they're having a positive relationship, even if on the surface, insensibly, it doesn't seem to make any difference, right? So that's interesting. Now, I'm, this is the third new idea I've had since we started talking. Uh, I, I can relate his definition, very fundamental definition, that existence and nothing merge insensibly. So if I add one and zero and I get one, looks like I can't see any difference. In other words, I, it hasn't changed anything. I'm back to one. But is that only because it's, there's a, that it's, there's something of the relationship that's insensible to me? Do you see what I'm saying? That's my new idea for the day, my third new idea. Okay, I have to think that, I'm gonna think about that more. So when I'm looking at this, I'm saying, well, I'm, by this time, I'm uh, far enough along in the thinking now occurring to know, you know, there's no notion of self, and then analogously, as a kind of projection of the, of the unchanging and um, somewhat amorphous self, um, there's no notion of nothing. But both Boole and Peirce, in their own different ways, are using nothing as fundamental to their logical, to their logical calculus. Um, so if I take Boole's original problem, one plus zero equals, and then he said that he stops, and I take Peirce's version, one plus zero equals one, which is what we would normally expect in our everyday mathematics. What's, what's the third alternative if there's no nothing? Or, or another way of putting it, how could I illustrate in that same context that I've just described to you that there is no nothing? So I'll add, in the thinking now occurring, one and zero. They both did that. Bull copped out before he got on the other side of the equal sign. Mm -hmm. Purse went ahead and put a one down. And I went ahead and I put on the other side of the equal sign, one plus zero equals unum, which is a zero with a line over it. Right. And if, if it doesn't tell you anything else, right, it doesn't tell you much. <laughs> Something new is going on, we at least know that. Well, it tells you one thing. It tells you explicitly that that zero, one plus zero, if it equals unum, doesn't equal, it doesn't not equal anything, and it doesn't equal one. If it equals unum, that whatever, whatever that zero is, it ain't nothing. <laughs> right? 
its impact on the one is explicit in real ternary logic. Hmm. Okay? Yeah. So that's the first basic step. Right. And then as a corollary of that, okay, well, no, it's not a corollary. It's, I've just proven it. So, so, so now I have, th I have three digits, two of which are identical to bool and to purse, although they compute differently in the two different logics. Bool's logic in purse's idea is a logic of absolutes. And in the lo and he understands his own logic to be a logic of relatives. Now this gets infinitely complicated logically, right? But much beyond anything we have to concern ourselves with, or even I have to concern myself with, because I don't buy the premise. <laughs> okay. But notice, Bull's logic is a logic of absolutes, and uh, Peirce's logic is a logic of relatives. Or, yeah, or I was thinking of the syllogism you talked about before, kind of a particularization of it in some way, or maybe that's... that's uh, well, it, it might be, but I, I don't see it right yeah, off okay. uh, right. The third real trying to be logic example, one plus zero equals unum, turns out to be, in the thinking now occurring, a logic of absolute relatives, okay. or relative absolutes. Mm. You and I right, are relative absolutes. Relative insofar as I create you and you create me, and absolutes insofar as there's no necessity for us to be created. There's no necessity for us to be in this relationship. Uh, we are, in some sense, absolutely unique, singular, particular entities to begin with. It, as I'm saying that, I, I, I'm not think, I don't normally think theologically at this point, but I'm thinking the theological equivalent would be that um, in Thomas, uh, God is infinitely close. In other words, God operates through, this is Thomistic, so I'm, I'm not accepting this as a rubric for thinking, but right. it's an analog of what I'm driving at. Yeah. Uh, in Thomas, uh, God, God's causality works in two ways. It works through secondary causes. It works through intermediaries. And it works immediately. And uh, Thomas understands, and as far as that goes, that would be consistent with the thinking now occurring minus the uh, latter idea. Hmm. Uh, it, uh, me, ah, in fact, even more fundamentally, I, I, I do say that uh, the, the immediate or mediation and the immediate are identical with each other. Right? Hmm. Um, so this would be an example of what I was, we were talking about earlier, a difference in identity being identical, where there's no, uh, there's no alt necessity of a notion of, of an alternative to those mm -hmm. possibilities. Um, but to go back to the logic, so, um, so that gave me a logic with a, uh, a one, a zero, most importantly, and an unum, none of which were nothing, right? Um, the unum had to be a modified something or other. It had to be a modified one. And uh, zero couldn't have been nothing. It had to be a something or other. Otherwise, it would have been there to modify the one to produce the unum. Right? So I got, rid of the, I got rid of the nothing maybe in an afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and having gotten rid of the nothing, uh, then the further notion, uh, and this, this would be uh, relevant particularly to... Um, the appearance in effect of the logic in, um, in um, Peirce's uh, thinking. Uh, in Peirce's thinking, there is an absolute first, which would be at the zero end, if I can put it that way. Right? So from your, from your, your, well, if you're reading left to right, it doesn't make any difference. But from your point of view uh, in, in the conversation, there's, a, there's an absolute first, and if the absolute first is preceded by anything, it's preceded from s some form of nothing, right? I think his best candidate for that is nothing in particular, which, by the way, is interesting, right, mm -hmm. in terms of what we've said before, right? Uh, a kind of universal nothing. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, he's, uh, it's, it's the end at which we have the absolute first. And then we have the absolute last, which is the second or the absolute... The second is the last, or the ab and it's the absolute last. And the reason there's an absolute first and an absolute second in Peirce's terms is that you can, something, you can have a first 
independently of anything else. And you can have a second. You don't need, and, and therefore, and by the way, and here, and here, speaking of necessity and freedom, and I make this point, I think, in uh, chapter 7, where I'm doing a critique not only of Hegel but of Peirce, there is a shift in Peirce uh, away from the priority of necessity in Hegel. So uh, just as we shift to a coexistence or irreducible being uh, in relation of self and other, then uh, in terms of logical categories, uh, the priority of necessity to freedom in Hegel is reversed in Peirce, mm. right? So the firstness is a kind of freshness, it's a kind of spontaneity, it's a kind of or we call it orients, originality, whatever you want to call it. It's something that wasn't there before, and in that sense it's closer to the thinking now occurring, which is all, which is freshness, newness all the way down. Um, but the second has a similar quality to the first, just as the first need not appear, but does, freely, right? N not of necessity. Uh, so the second, you could have a first, would never, never have a second. Okay. But when he gets the third, or the thirdness, as he calls them, firstness, secondness, and thirdness, each of which has their own, each of which are kind of phenomenological categories that have various aspects to them, which we need not discuss. Thirdness is, he says, by nature relative. So he right away, I think it's, as I'm speaking to you now, this is maybe my, my fourth idea for the day, it may be a premature move on his part. Um, and by the way, he was never totally satisfied with this. He spent all of his life, I wouldn't say he spent all his life, but long into his late years, he pondered the question whether there was a fourthness. Right? Mm. But never, never came, never, never affirmed such a thing. So he goes, he goes to thirdness, um, and immediately, I would say, as I'm thinking it out now, immediately assumes that thirdness is not like firstness and second, either which may or may not exist altogether, but thirdness is the relationship between the first and the second, and therefore, in a certain way, it's not absolute like they are, but it's relative. It's by its nature relative. That's his point. Um, so to go back to real, so, so we have, and now by the way, we have many, there are many versions of, I'll call for shorthand, three value or three digit logics, um, which are not, not to be confused with real trinary logic, right? So the mere fact that I have three digits, none of which are nothing, the fact that I have three digits is not unique to the thinking now occurring, right? So you can, you can have three digits where one is like Peirce's thirdness, mm -hmm. uh, an intermediary, a middle a In link. Reduces between one or the other. Yeah, right. right. Um, is that, do you think that's because there is some implicit notion of nothing that still exists in those, so, those trinary that, logics? That would be, that would be my, uh, I would assert that, but yeah. I, I, I'd have to think it through to say mm -hmm. how that is. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's right. Um, but in the absence of any notion of nothing, logically as well as conceptually in the thinking now occurring, then thirdness, there's no reason for thirdness to be, I, without ceasing to be relative, mm -hmm. goes back to my noting the, the way in which he characterizes Peirce does his logic over against Poole's, an absolute. So thirdness is, as it were, the embodiment in the real trying to be logic of, the absolute, of an absolutely relative logic, right? A logic in which the relative and the absolute are not alternatives to one another. Right. right? Um, living, it sounds like in some way. Huh? Living. Okay, I'm glad you said that because they're not, that will help me end the discussion of the real trinary logic okay. in an affirmative, constructive way. So when I look at, you frame this in the context of the uh, practical the impact. Yeah. yeah. I have no idea because in the thinking now occurring, there's no future, so I can't peer into it. However, Structurally, you could say this, that in the practice of the logic, mm -hmm. so if I line up on a piece of paper any number of these real trinary logic digits, zero, unum, and one, where none of them equals nothing, and I, uh, the logic en uh, uh, enables me, now here's the point, it allows me, I'm free to, it doesn't necessitate me to cancel any set of three identical digits. So I have three zeros and a one. 
if I just do the normal operations within real trinary logic, zero, zero gives me one. Mm -hmm. now that, that, that should stop you, but we won't stop on it. But, but I just tell you, that's the way it is. Gives you one. And so you have one more zero coming. So one times zero gives you unum. We already know that. We did mm -hmm. that. Right? And then unum times one gives me zero. So if I just multiplied that in the, uh, you might say, the most, uh, there's nothing conventional about real trinary logic, but in the most rudimentary, uh, rudimentary way, I would get, I would get um, zero as the, and I put an equal sign, triple zero times one equals zero. But I'm allowed to cancel the three digits, any three identical digits in any array of digits. And in that case, I'd be left with one. Right. Um, now, it's an interesting question why I'm allowed to do that, but that's not the point I want to make. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, know, you say, well, wait a minute, you know, why are you doing that? Right? Maybe that's related to the absence of nothing. I mean, who knows, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's another issue. That part I didn't quite, quite follow, but you want to get to something else anyway. Well, what I want to get to is the live idea, the yes. live idea. The point is that in this logic, if you give me an array of digits and ask me to solve it for some result, mm. you know, uh, it depends on what I do. Hmm. Whereas if I put an array of bulls digits down, there's some things I just can't do, yeah. and the other things I could find the answer in the back of the book, and even in purse, I could find the answer in the back of the book. So there's no disconnect, there's no separation between the logical guy and the logic he's using in the thinking now occurring. I'm not saying there are no limits whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there are no absolutes, as it were, in real trinary logic, but all of those absolutes are relatively so. And therefore, you could not know, except if you were a psychic of some sort, hmm. what or a result. Good guesser, I guess. Yeah, or a good guesser, what result I would get from a, an array of uh, logical digits. Hmm. And that allows for backing it up into a kind of pragmatic existential world that allows for a logic that doesn't actually operate in principle independently of the one who's doing the logical calculation, hmm. right? And as it were, the decision or decisions that that person makes. And then it's it's assumed that the decision or decisions that that person makes in reducing the logic to a kind of uh, result in a given circumstance will be a function of what makes the best sense in that context. Yeah. Right? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what we do. That's what it means to live. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what we're, we're always doing that, right? So I think in principle, although I have no idea personally, how it would uh, work out and be implemented. Uh, in principle, this is a logic for a, a, it's a logic that is a form of calculation that is closest to our lived experience. If it isn't actually in its own way, some kind of uh, calculus that embodies uh, our lived, the operations of our lived um, experience. Something along those lines, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> that's exciting. Is there? Uh, do you know of anybody that's played around with it that actually no, believes I don't. It, no. it to be a, a real? Because no, I, I know there's probably people arguing that you can't do it in some way, or it's going to reduce at some point that third digit to one of the other digits. And right, right. So there's nobody. Well, I think a lot of other stuff it would in itself to work uh, in the in a way in which you're uh, imagining. It, it would need a larger context in which to work. Right. In other words, uh, and, I, and I just don't inhabit that right. uh, technical right. uh, universe, personally. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I can only do what I can do. Right? <laughs> Create problems. <laughs>